House be in order. Prior to going to recess, the House was at the 11th order of business. The House will have under consideration House Bill 274. The gentleman from District 15. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would request unanimous consent to dispense with the reading of House Bill uh, 274. You've all heard the unanimous consent request. Is there an objection? Hearing none, the good gentleman from District 15 is recognized to open the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this bill addresses an issue that has been uh, ongoing for about a decade. Um, about a decade ago, a number of cities began offering uh, driver safety programs. And the way they would uh, have folks go into these programs is if they were pulled over for a, a traffic violation, the uh, officer would give them the option of either get a, getting a citation or going to the city traffic school. And uh, if they, uh, of course, the advantage of going to the city traffic school is that they would not get a citation and they would not get points on their record and the uh, city would uh, then have some safety training and charge a fee for this. And a couple of problems with this is, number one, it was happening outside of our uniform citation system, uh, which tracks uh, everything through I-STARS. And the cities were using their own uh, citations to, and summons to, to send people to these driver schools. Secondly, it uh, diverts funds from the normal fine distribution formula that funds uh, I-STARS, funds POST, funds uh, county uh, justice funds, and the like to run the courts. And so last year there was a bill that made it partway through, but it did not fully address all of these issues. Uh, in the interim, uh, I've worked with the courts, with the cities, uh, with ITD, and uh, we've got House Bill uh, 274. Basically what it does, um, and, and I should back up and say that in 2008, the Attorney General issued an opinion that basically told these cities that they were operating outside the law. And so about half of the cities uh, dropped their driver safety programming. The other ones had a difference of opinion and continued and uh, feel that the uh, programs actually, uh, and I, I think they do provide some uh, refresher course for, for drivers and, and uh, there's some evidence that it does provide a benefit. So in trying to uh, address all of these issues, uh, we now have uh, House Bill 274, which allows a city to adopt a driver safety program by ordinance uh, if a a driver is stopped for a moving violation and it's not involving a collision, uh, they have the option in, uh, to go to the driver's school, but it all goes into I-STARS. They still get the citation, but if they complete the course, then they don't get the points that are associated with that citation. There's some limitations here. Uh, they, uh, you can't take it more than every three years, or if you've had a point reduction through uh, ITD has a similar course, and uh, if you've had a point reduction in the last three years, you can't do that. Um, also, it doesn't apply to commercial drivers. There's some issues about uh, uh, allowing that to happen. And so uh, this, uh, this is what House Bill uh, 274 does, is set up this program, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Is there further debate? Hearing none, the debate is closed. The question is, shall House Bill 274 pass the House? The clerk will unlock the machine and the members will cast their votes. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change their vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the roll. The roll call shows 65 ayes, 0 nay, 5 absent, and excused. House Bill 274 is passed. The House is a correction to title. Hearing none, House Bill 274 will be transmitted to the Senate. The House will now have under consideration House Bill 292. The gentleman from District 4. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that we dispense with any further reading of House Bill 292. 
You've all heard the unanimous consent request. Is there an objection? Hearing none, the good gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the House, this is, uh, this is a bill that deals with assaults on doctors and other health care professionals. It's become a problem in Idaho, and I, I've passed out some letters from people who are in the health care profession uh, for you to consider. This bill serves as a tool for deterring such violence. It's uh, supported by the Medical Association, the Idaho Hospital Association, St. Alphonsus, Kootenai Medical Center, the emergency room directors in each hospital um, that, uh, that I just listed, including St. Luke's, um, and Grit Memorial, Portneuf Medical Center, and uh, um, they all wholeheartedly support this bill. This bill has been, this is actually a second iteration of what we've tried to do uh, to address this problem. And uh, to give you a little bit of background on what the problem is, nationally a four-year Bureau of Justice statistics study showed that between 2002 and 2010, 69,500 nurses and 10,000 physicians were assaulted. According to a 2010 survey from the Emergency Nurses Association, one in four ER nurses reported being assaulted more than 20 times over the past three years. The survey noted that the violence seemed to be increasing at the time the number of alcohol, drug, and psychiatric-related patients was rising. OSHA confirms that the rising rate of assaults and re confirms the rising rate of assaults and recently said that the risk of job-related violence against healthcare and social workers is presently higher than for any other field. According to the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, each day more than 9,000 healthcare workers are injured or verbally or physically attacked on the job. OSHA's guidelines on preventing violence against healthcare workers express great concern about the likely underreporting of violence and persistent perception within the healthcare industry that assaults are part of the job. And one thing I'd like to point out is that, that healthcare workers are mandated, particularly in emergency rooms, are mandated to uh, provide care for individuals even when they're being violent. So they're in this situation, uh, as, as the statistics I just read to you tell the story. They're in a situation that is becoming increasingly violent and they're mandated to provide care in that. And so, again, what this bill does is attempt to deter that violence. Um, <clears throat> and to give you some Idaho-specific in, uh, information, uh, Kootenai Medical Center from my district, they keep records of assaults and um, uh, are, are starting to keep track record of assaults. Most say it happens frequently, most hospitals do, and that the existing penalties under law are so minuscule that they just don't bother. Um, so we don't have a lot of statistics now, but we are starting to track this here within the state. Predominantly, these assaults include uh, significant physical conduct, such as pushing and pulling the victim, and you can certainly read about those in, uh, in those letters that I passed out to you. Um, and I have, I, I could go into a ton of detail. I mean, we just have uh, uh, so many firsthand accounts from throughout the state, a lot of them from up in my district, but certainly from every hospital uh, here in Idaho. The other issue we're facing is that these individuals, um, these violent individuals are sometimes confronting healthcare workers on the street because they know that individual is a healthcare worker and are looking uh, a lot of times uh, in drug-seeking activity to say, I, I need you to write me a prescription, knowing that that individual in their civilian mode out on the street is a, is, is a physician uh, by, by occupation and trying to coerce them to, to write prescriptions. So um, a little bit about this bill and how it's constructed. Originally, uh, to address this problem, the Judiciary and Rules Committee had uh, contemplated a adding the healthcare workers language into existing statute under Idaho code 18-915 there's there's a pretty exhaustive list of individuals who are who are of a protected class and and if that if someone assaults or batters those people who are part of those classes there's enhanced penalties uh, the uh, judiciary and rules committee rejected that and so specifically for three reasons, which I think were excellent reasons in him. And, and because of the way we approached this, this did get out of judiciary and rules with a due pass recommendation. So specifically what the issues were, were under 18-915 with that exhaustive list that protects police officers and tax collectors and, and a whole array of individuals. It's a 25-year penalty. This is only a up to five-year penalty. Um, 
there's also a specific uh, affirmative defense in here in regards to mental health. So if, if uh, probably the best way to do this is just read the language. It shall be an affirmative defense to a violation of this section that the commission of the act was by a person who at the time of the commission of the act lacked the ability to form the intent to commit the act because of a mental illness. So, um, and that was a major concern of the committee, uh, was, was what, particularly in the healthcare industry, you obviously have people who, are, who are, have uh, mental health issues, and if that is the cause of their, of their violence, if they, and they can't form the requisite intent to commit a battery or a assault, that this, this would provide for affirmative defense. And then the, the third thing that we specifically tailored that the original statute uh, that 18915 currently doesn't have for those other individuals who are a protected class is that of uh, the specific um, status. So under 18-915 under currently, just because someone is, say, a police officer, any battery could potentially include them in this. What, what this proposed, what this bill does is says, if, that, if the health care worker is in the commission of their duties or if the battery is, is uh, committed because of the status of that individual. So it can't be a doctor who gets in a fight, for example, over a fence line. It's not an enhanced penalty because that fence line argument happened to be, one of the parties happened to be a doctor. So it has to be specific to that individual. So that's, that's the crux of what... Um, the concerns of the committee were and what this bill specifically addresses. So I would urge your green light, and I'm, I'm expecting that we'll have some healthy debate on this and some questions, and I'm happy to stand for those. Is there further debate? Gentleman from six. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman yield to, some, uh, to a question? Will the gentleman yield to a question? The gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, good gentlemen, uh, I'm uh, interested in what the definition of mental illness is in this section, uh, and would it include dementia, and would it include metabolic disorders such as hypoglycemia, hypoxemia, uh, or is it strictly those that fall under uh, the classification of severe and persistent mental illness? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, gentleman from six, the, the operative language includes mental illness, but it also includes uh, lacked the ability to form the intent to commit the crime. So mental illness is broad, but it's, but it's tailored to having the requisite intent. M Mr. Speaker, may I ask another question? Let's find out. Will the gentleman yield? <laughs> the gentleman yields. Yep, the gentleman yields. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just for those of us who haven't been in this realm, uh, uh, for uh, standard assault and battery uh, convictions, what is the penalty that's prescribed in law? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, gentleman from six, the underlying statutes to which this will be an expansion are 18.903 and 18.901, which are standard misdemeanors, and so those are six months or or um, a $1,000 fine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen. Thank you. Is there further debate? The gentleman from District 21. The gentleman from four yield to a question. The gentleman yield. Gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. I think I understand the, uh, you know, increasing the severity of a, of a battery charge. I'm a little uh, concerned that we're also increasing the severity of an assault charge, which would be the apprehension, apprehension of violence. Why would that need to fall into the same scope. Challenge from four. Uh, Mr. Speaker, good gentleman, an assault is a, is, is a crime that happens essentially on the way to a battery. So uh, there are certain situations where, an, I mean, assault is a crime as well, and certainly an assault in that, in a healthcare environment is something we want to protect these individuals and deter as well as a battery. Thank you. Challenge from 21. Is there further debate? Gentleman from 24. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, would the good gentleman uh, stand for a question? Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman, I'm looking at line 14 here, and it appears to apply to any employee of a health institution, hospital, medical clinic, or practice, 
when the victim is performing his or her professional employment duties. So if the janitor is sweeping up the health care clinic in the middle of the night and someone comes into the building in search of medications or drugs and assaults this individual, would that person be covered under this circumstances even though they're not a licensed or health care provider? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good gentleman. That is correct. The, what, the, the problem that we're dealing with, and if you, uh, uh, reading through those letters, there, there are people who work in this industry and are become, and falling victim to these crimes simply because of the, the nature of the area they're working in. So it's become a high risk environment for them to work and people will become involved in these altercations across the board, including janitors. Mostly it happens to nurses, it happens a lot to billing staff, people who are on the front lines. Uh, dealing with these individuals, but yes, it, it would include a janitor, uh, people who are employed by the hospital in this high-risk environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, good gentleman. Is there further debate? Gentleman from two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the good gentleman from four stand for a question? Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman. I'm curious if the health care providers are not reporting these incidents What's to say that six months in jail and a thousand dollar fine is not sufficient to curtail these incidents? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good gentleman. That comes from anecdotal evidence that we have from talking to these individuals. And if you'll read again, I'll refer you back to those letters that I did pass out. These, there's this kind of a sense of hopelessness in regards to if I, if I get into a bar fight, I'm going to face the same, same penalties as if I go into a, a hospital. Uh, drunk and start beating on people who are required to give care to me. So these enhanced penalties um, are a way for A, deterrence, and, and B, to give uh, a little bit of a, of a more of an incentive to report these crimes when, when there's kind of a sense of hopelessness among people who work in the healthcare industry that, that their uh, concerns are not being addressed by the current legal structure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there further debate? Gentleman from 21. I stand to debate the bill. Gentleman has the floor. Thank you. You know, we talk about the janitor and we care for, the, for his, for his uh, well-being. You know, I think about uh, security guards, uh, armored truck uh, vehicle drivers. I think about uh, the night shift at 7-Eleven, and I wonder if he or they are in similar dire circumstances. I suppose we're always at risk to a different degree in the different positions that we hold. And I wonder if we are, are in this case, simply uh, you know, going too far and maybe opening up a, an area where, you know, we all feel threatened in one way or another at, in different times of our life, in different uh, positions in our lives, and uh, to support the uh, janitor and the doctor and the nurse. Maybe I wanted to, I wanted to defend the, uh, you know, the Maverick employee just as much, but I think we have laws that uh, make this against the law, and uh, I would uh, just say that. Thank you. So further debate, gentleman from six. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman yield for a question? Will again? the gentleman from District Four yield to a, to a question? The gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, unfortunately, a previous questioner brought something up to my mind. You, you mentioned that if someone were to come in and drunk and punish somebody in the emergency room, they would be liable for this bill. But um, that brings to mind. Uh, a, um, a alcoholic encephalopathy or a, a substance abuse disorder with uh, me mental impairment. And uh, again, the question that I have is, what is the definition of mental illness? Good gentleman from District 4. Mr. Speaker, gentleman from 6, that, that <laughs> there is no definition in this statute for mental illness. That would be a, that would be a question that would be determined by the jury in this in this case. Thank you. Is there further debate? The lady from District Five. Uh, thank you. I would like to just briefly weigh in in favor of this bill. Um, sometimes I think there are segments of the population that are put at much greater risk because of. Uh, what they do and the situations in which they find themselves. And uh, I must, might just comment, I have a relative who is a physician who uh, mentions to me right, quite regularly how aggressively some people in, 
come, are who come into the office uh, seeking drugs and uh, trying to give reasons why they really need them and, um, and the situation does become uh, dangerous and threatening in some situations. So uh, even though I can agree that it might seem strange to ca carve out certain segments of the population for additional protection, I think this is one case where it would be warranted. Is there further debate? Good gentleman from District 20. Um, rise to debate the bill. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you. Um, I uh, first want to acknowledge the health care providers that we have, and, and as, long as, as well as our policemen, our firemen, the work that they do, it is not an easy job um, in any uh, respect there. And so it's with a little bit of intrepidation that I, that I debate against this. Um, but I do, but I do want to point out that um, if increased penalties will solve our problem, then why are we stopping here? Why shouldn't we increase the penalties for any assault or battery? If, if that's a solution, then we should really be looking at that for everybody because uh, I'm not sure that if it's going to if it's going to solve it there or provide a, a better help in the hospital, then I think then we should look at that for for other aspects as well. Um, in, in addition, the assault uh, portion of it worries me a little bit, um, simply because the assault, uh, 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 an assault, in our as defined in Title 18, Chapter 9, in our codes 18901, uh, it says it's an unlawful attempt coupled with the apparent ability to commit violent injury. So you have to be able to do that, and then um, it's an intentional threat by word or action, and so that we're, we're lumping in also in our code we've defined assault and battery a little bit differently and we've, we've punished a little differently because there is a distinction between the two and yet with this bill we're lumping them together um, and uh, I guess uh, the, the thing that, that I guess uh, got me the most I guess when you go into battery it talks about the punishment there for battery if I knowingly beat up a, and, it's, and it's knowingly beat up a pregnant woman the maximum penalty there is a uh, one year in jail and the distinction between a health care provider then getting a five-year, it just doesn't seem to fit with my logic there. And so um, not that I'm not aware of the issues that we have in our health care profession, and, and I'm, that, that's not the reason I'm, I'm debating against it. I just don't see the consistency here in our, in our approach, and for that reason I'm voting against it. Is there further debate? Good lady from District 8. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, this, is, this is kind of a tough one. And I'll tell you why it's tough for me. It's because a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, Salt Lake City, I had a friend who, incidentally, was an attorney. He's, he's passed away now. And he went berserk in a grocery store. The cops were called. And in subduing him, they broke his arm. Obviously, he had a mental problem. But they hospitalized him. They, and he didn't hurt them, so I guess they didn't have any complaints. But uh, I'm a little confused on, on this mix of, uh, of uh, mental illness. Uh, people who are bipolar quite frequently go a little astray, so to speak. And uh, somebody will call a cop. With, is this bill going to automatically, let's say they've got them to the hospital, is this bill automatically going to put someone like that in, uh, in prison? Which, if, the, if they do, it certainly won't do that individual any good. It'll just make him worse. So are we really protecting our mental problems? Did I ask for an inquiry? You, you did not, and we're oh. considering this debate. <sighs> You're not going to let me inquire. <laughs> well, the lady well, can always re inquire. Well, would the, would the gentleman just respond to that? I, I, my confusion is, what are we doing on the mental the lady, level uh, here? Let's ask him. We, will the gentleman yield? And, and good lady, if you'll rephrase and, and make your question a little bit more concise. The gentleman yields. So Thank place you, your question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And part of my problem is the gentleman is behind that pillar. And I wasn't too sure. <laughs> where the voice was coming from. But that is, gentlemen, if you don't mind, can you help me out a little bit there? I, 
I don't want legitimately uh, mental problems, legitimate men mental problems, just automatically uh, thrown in jail. Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, good lady. That, that is the intent of our language in regards, to the, in, in regards to creating an affirmative defense for mental illness is to protect those who, who are lashing out violently, not because of an intent to do so, but because of, of mental illness. Good lady from eight. Okay, just a brief follow-up. Will the gentleman yield further? Gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay, under those circumstances, there would seem to be some, some protection. Uh, if it is determined that it is a, a mental deficiency, the result of some sort of mental incapacity. But how long is it going to take them to figure that out? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good lady, I think that would be a case-by-case -case determinative issue. In some, in some cases, that may be something that's apparent early on and, and the ca case wouldn't be charged or, or even reported, or it would be or, or it could be an issue that would actually be an issue of fact that would go to the jury. One more follow-up, Well, the please. gentleman yield further. Gentleman yields. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, all right, I, I'm kind of getting there, I think so. <clears throat> Let's assume some assault and battery occurs. Under the present bill, it would just be treated as assault and battery with no interest in whether or not there was a mental incapacitation. Um, and he probably would be put in jail. So is this bill making enough of a distinction? In other words, if nobody really knew that he, say, were bipolar or what's, I can't think of all the mental things we could have. If they didn't know that, then under the current law, he's toast and this would make it better Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good lady, the, the, the ability to form a requisite intent is always an issue for crimes. So I, I would say that, that even in those situations, someone who's mentally ill would have protections under, under, under law. Um, for example, if I, if I were to be gesticulating wildly here and accidentally whack the good gentleman from two in the face, I, I battered him by the law, but I haven't formed a requisite intent to do so. Likewise, if, if you have a mental illness, you, can't, you don't have the ability to form that requisite intent. That's something that's taken into account both, um, well, in, in the criminal law realm. What this does is provide extra protections on top of that for the enhanced penalties under this statute in regards to people who commit assault and battery on health care workers. Good lady from eight. I've got to ask one more, Mr. Speaker, please. That's okay. Uh, if the gentleman will yield. The gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. You know, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we go through this protocol, and by the time I get to where I need to be, I forgot what I was going to ask. <laughs> to the extent that that's my fault, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we have an incident. Oh, we, you just made a comment about enhanced penalties. Are the penalties under the new law enhanced even though there may be some allowance made for a mental problem? Are the penalties still enhanced above what they are currently? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good lady. In a situation where someone can form the requisite intent, i.e. They, they don't have a mental illness that would, that would keep them from forming that requisite intent, and they committed a battery on a health care worker in, because that person was a health care worker or in the, in the health care setting, that individual would be liable for these enhanced penalties. Lady from eight. Potentially. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I've had some personal familiarity with this kind of thing and I'm really confused. I don't I don't know what I'll do when it comes to a vote. But thank you, Mr. Speaker. You've been very patient. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. 
Is there further debate? Good, gentle, good lady from District 11. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I thought I would just rise and share some information that came to our committee regarding this bill. And I think the one thing I thought that might help is that this bill was really aimed at those individuals who come into a hospital actually searching for drugs is usually when this occurs and they're being assaulted and it's a very specific instance for the most part and this is the difficulty that our hospitals are dealing with and it really goes back to the substance abuse issue that Idaho has here. Uh, if you look up in statute also we did talk about the enhanced penalty Part of that penalty, though, really is to bring it up on the radar of the law enforcement and have some uh, teeth put into this. The intent is not to throw more people in, in jail, because on our Jude and Rules Committee, we're pretty good about watching how many people go there, because there's a lot of money involved there. But when we can arrest these individuals in a hospital, have this penalty, we also have the options of sending them then to some of our specialty courts, our substance abuse treatment centers, these types of things, and be able to get this issue under control. Uh, in statute, there are other very special people who are uh, have this extra protection. However, the enhanced penalty on some of those people is actually 25 years. And we did not agree that we would go ahead and add that penalty to, to this class of people. Uh, because we do understand, you really do have to differentiate when has somebody come to the hospital seeking uh, care, when are they in pain, when is it a mental illness, versus when are they coming in there uh, and really seeking drugs and, and wreaking havoc. And that's really what this is based on, and we want to protect our hospital workers. For some of the other people in code who are protected, just as a as a very small list, actually, but emergency workers, our firemen, our police, our judges, and even our social workers. These type of people that deal with very specific instances, most of them deal with substance abuse and crime issues. Uh, that's really what this is also geared for. With the intention, though, however, that we want to be able to jump on this, we want to protect our hospital people, and yet on the other side, you want to balance it with actually probably work towards more fixing the problem rather than adding to the problem. And so I just wanted to share some of that that came out of the committee uh, from members of the House. Thank you. Is there further debate? Gentleman from, I'm going to go with the good lady from District 33. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I sat here and I wondered whether or not I was going to stand because I am a co-sponsor on this. But it isn't just about those that are seeking drugs. See, I have a daughter who works in the, in, in the hospital. And there are other instances that happen, and they happen on a, 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 quite frequently for these nurses and for these health care providers. When a, a nurse has to go in and assess a patient, they have to get very close to this person. And uh, in assessing a certain patient, uh, my daughter leaned over, was adjusting some things. And he reached up and he fondled her. And at first she was taken back, so she, she moved away. And then she came back and he did it again. And then as she was trying to leave the room, he pulled her onto the bed. These are situations that happen for these people quite frequently. And they do need the added protection. Uh, they do not need to subject themselves to these types of treatments, and yet there are those out there that feel that they are entitled to treat their health care workers differently. So I would very much recommend that we go with a green light on this one. Thank you. Is there further debate? Good lady from District 35. Mr. Speaker, would the gentleman um, respond to a question? Well, the gentleman... Uh, Gentleman That's yields. another question. Yes, the gentleman yields. I'm, I'm trying to understand the gentleman. I believe um, what this does is makes this crime a, a uh, felony. Is that correct? Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good lady, that is correct. And if I might, Mr. Speaker, ask again. Will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yields. The gentleman Thank yields. you. And then the so the five year is not uh, is not absolutely uh, the case in all uh, felonies. This would be a, a, a special circumstance. Is that correct, gentleman from four, Mr. Speaker? Good lady, that is correct. This is a specific circumstance, uh, specifically tailored uh, 
felony enhancement that doesn't increase the fine levels but does increase the jail time. And, and because it is over a year, that classifies it as a felony. It is discretionary uh, upon, you know, whether or not a deal is made uh, in regards to the case or what the judge will impose at sentencing, uh, whether or not that full five years will be used or whether or not something between the, the regular penalties for battery and, and the full five years will be used. Mr. Speaker, one more. Uh, the gentleman yield one more time. Uh, will the gentleman yield? The gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. Then just to be sure in my mind, uh, it seems to me that this is a mandatory. If that's mandatory, it really doesn't give the judge discretion in, uh, in the imposition of the five-year fine or the five-year prison penalty. Gentleman from four. Mr. Speaker, good lady. Good lady, that is incorrect. It, it was a, it, the language is specifically tailored to give up to the five-year penalty, not requiring any, not requiring actually any jail time at all. If there was a, it just it just says that that is the maximum penalty that can be given. No, well, that helps me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, gentlemen. Is there further debate? Gentleman from two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To debate against the bill. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are a number of things that uh, are of concern here, I think. Certainly the first is the uh, definition that we're dealing with with respect to mental illness and that capacity for intent. I think that there, uh, the bill itself brings confusion to the penalties for assault and battery, and I think that that is a concern and should be better defined. The idea that uh, somehow the purpose of the bill is to incentivize reporting for these incidents is of concern as well. It seems to me that if the uh, uh, health care workers are not even reporting these, we, uh, six months is a long time to be in jail for even the assaults that the good lady was talking about. And whether or not these would actually uh, 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 prohibit this be or deter this behavior uh, any more or less is, is really, uh, I think, questionable. And whether or not uh, we're targeting those that are searching for drugs, that is an issue here that is not addressed fully uh, within the bill itself. So uh, we're not really even able to represent that the current penalties, if applied properly, would deter this type of behavior. And, and I think that this bill just needs, needs some work and uh, probably is not appropriate at this time. Thank you. Is there further debate? Hearing none, would the good gentleman from District 4 care to close the debate? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just very briefly, several things. Um, first, in regards to the issue that was brought up in fondling, if I could direct you one, this one last time to the letters that I've given you, that is, that is certainly a widespread problem where uh, there's intentional fondling of particularly female nurses that, that's happening in, in the healthcare industry, and, and that would constitute a battery and would be protected under this statute. In regards to the, uh, the uh, example of people who are in a line of work, such as working at 7-Eleven, those individuals are not mandated to continue to give care to the individual after they become abusive. That law enforcement can intervene at that point in time, so you don't have that mandated relationship like you do in the healthcare realm, where a physician and a nurse are required to continue to give care to somebody who may be violent, intentionally being violent uh, to cause harm. Um, and, and just a little bit of my personal perspective, a majority of the batteries that we prosecute are, don't fall in this realm. A, lot, a majority of them are usually mutual fights, whether it be a, of a semi-domestic nature or a, a feud over a fence, or, and most commonly a house fight, uh, or a party breaking, or a fight breaking out at a house party or at a bar, those kind of things. So and that was certainly just from anecdotal evidence. I don't have any numbers to back that up, but that was certainly the majority of batteries that I prosecuted. And obviously, when you have that mandated relationship, someone's trying to provide care, that's not the same kind of situation as those situations. And, and I just, the lot, I, wa I wanna hammer on the deterrent effect. I do think that this is a deterrent uh, when it comes to the penalties, and, and again, I can speak from experience, when it comes to battery, usually, unless it was an aggravated battery or something that would take it up to a felony level, 
It's, it's usually about two days on the sheriff's labor program and a $250 fine that people walk out with. That was why I would say it would be the majority of resolution to batteries. And again, I think what we're talking about here, the instances that you have examples of and that we've talked about today don't fall in that realm and those are not appropriate penalties. And so this would, this would give it a little bit more teeth um, and, and, and make the healthcare profession, these individuals who are mandated to give care, feel a little bit safer. And the last thing I want to touch on is uh, there is a definition for mentally ill in code. It's in Title 66, so it's instructive, perhaps not binding, but that section reads, mentally ill means a person who, as a result of substantial disorder of thought, mood, perception, orientation, or memory, which grossly impairs judgment, behavior, capacity to recognize and adapt to reality, requires care and treatment at a facility or through outpatient treatment. So just wanted to throw that out there for a little bit of clarification. I would really appreciate uh, your green light on this vote, and, and thank you. The debate is closed. The question is, shall House Bill 292 pass the House? The clerk will unlock the machine, and the members will cast their vote. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change his vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the roll. The roll call shows. Mr. Speaker, I have um, some pairs at the desk. Uh, Representative Boyle votes not, nay, and Representative Maline votes aye. Thank you. The, the roll call shows 40 aye, 27 nay, 3 absent excused. House Bill 292 has passed. The House is a correction of the title. Hearing none, House Bill 292 will be transmitted to the Senate. The House will now have under consideration House Bill 279. Good gentleman from District 8. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that we dispense with the full reading of House Bill 279. You've all heard the unanimous consent request. Is there an objection? Hearing none, the gentleman from District 8 is recognized to open the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I bring to you House Bill 279. The purpose of this act is to clarify Idaho law relating to registration of boats, snowmobiles, and off ride highway vehicles. And I will begin by why this legislation is necessary. Legislation is needed to clarify that recreational registration managed through Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation are not linked to titling, which is managed by Idaho Department of Transportation. Although there is nothing in Title 67 that mandates a title be linked to recreational registration, it has been the supposition of Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation that they must link the two together. I am. Uh, just ch we are changing some words in this statute that uh, makes it so they may share that information, but they aren't mandated to do so. The registration program was never intended to be a means for ownership validation, nor was it intended to be used as an enforcement tool. In fact, registration began in the light, late 1960s and early 1970s, but not until 2000 was titling even required. The purpose of the registration program has always been a means for recreationists to pool their money for betterment of their pursuits, to tax themselves so they could build infrastructure necessary to enjoy their sports. It has always been operated through a vendor-dealer program that makes registration compliance easy and convenient for the users. As we all know, if we ever had to go to the DMV, the ITD system is not convenient. Many of our Local county assessors have been closed on Fridays. The only time you could get uh, your license work done is when DMV at your county is open. And the recreationists prefer to have, be able to get their recreation stickers from the vendor program like they have for many years. Interestingly, the recreation registration program was originally managed by ITD. Approximately 30 years ago, it was moved from ITD to Idaho Department of Parks and Recreation 
because the recreation community wanted the program managed by recreation professionals. They have spoken again loudly and clearly. They want IDPR to manage recreation activity, the recreation program by which recreation dollars are generated, and ITD to manage the titles. The registration program is paid entirely by users through up to 15% administration fee and each registration for boats, snowmobiles, and off-road vehicles. There are no general funds or parks funds utilized. So the best way we know to uh, resolve these issues is to make some corrections to the statute. Uh, user groups that support this, Mr. Speaker, are the Idaho Recreation Council, the Idaho State Snowmobile Association, the Idaho ATV Association, Blue Ribbon Coalition, Fremont County, Valley County, they run two of the largest programs in the state, the Idaho State UTV Association, the Idaho Trail Machine Association, and all the vendors across the state want to continue with the program that they have been utilizing for the past 30 years. And what happened here was Department of Parks and Recreation was wanting to move all this all this requirement over to the Idaho Department of Transportation and the user groups uh, really do not want to change that. And I'm here today, Mr. Speaker, to defend our customers and our users of the great state of Idaho. And I would ask for your yes vote on House Bill 279. Is there further debate? Good lady from District 18. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to debate against this bill. Lady has the floor. Thank you. Actually, in uh, Title 67, Chapter 71, in 7102 and 7103, it says snowmobiles, boats, ATVs, all those must be titled and register in Idaho. The top paragraph of, on page 11 of this bill and uh, the bottom paragraph on page 9 says um, IDPR does not have, uh, does that they may communicate with the Idaho Department of Transportation. The currently, as, well, as of July 1st, the Department of Parks and Rec will not have a computer that will share data with Idaho Department of, uh, of Transportation. So the bill says you, the, the current, current, uh, current law says you shall title your, uh, your, machine, your vehicle, but this bill says you may give this information to I, uh, Idaho Tra Transportation Department, that IDPR may give this information to Idaho Transportation Department. This allows some people who buy and sell vehicles to avoid paying sales tax on the purchase and the resale of their, their machines. This allows an outdated computer to go out of date July 1st at IDPR, and this, this whole system of registration and stickers may go away July 1st because they don't have the equipment to, to do what they need to do at Parks and Rec. They can't share the data with Idaho Transportation Department. They will go back to copies in triplicate, paper copies that vendors get and have to mail in. It's an outdated system, outmoded system. They had a different bill that failed. This bill is just not quite there. It's not quite gelled and it's in conflict with current code. So I vote, I would uh, urge your no vote. Is there, is there further debate? Good lady from District 4. Mr. Speaker, just to declare Rule 38, I'm a off-road vehicle dealer as well. Is there anything you don't sell up there? <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. And the journal will reflect that the lady from District 4 declared under Rule 38 a possible conflict. Is there further debate? Gentleman from District 25. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the gentleman yield to a question? Will the gentleman from District 8 yield to a question? Gentleman yields. Gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentlemen, does this legislation correct the problem that is, that is there? Gentleman from 8. <clears throat> In my opinion, this legislation solves the current issue. However, this is not the end game. We're going to continue to work on this 
as we move forward. Gentleman from 20. Is there further debate? Good gentleman from District 24. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the good gentleman yield to another question? The gentleman question? from District 8 yield to another question. The gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman, do you have an estimate of how much revenue is taken in uh, for the registration of these vehicles and, and would therefore be, uh, be transferred or lost? Uh, and and second sort of part of that is, uh, is it so that the vehicle then would not be uh, registered uh, with a title, uh, a legal title? Gentleman from eight. Mr. Speaker, good gentleman, I believe there were two questions there. First, titling and registration are two different functions. Titling of an off-road vehicle must be done through your local DMV. Titling of a boat must be done through your local B DMV, and titling of a snowmobile must also be done with your DMV, which that information is kept with the Department of Transportation. And that is whenever you purchase a vehicle, that is your responsibility. However, the recreational <coughs> registration is side and separate from that. And there is a tremendous revenue here. Uh, I don't have the total revenue, but I do know that uh, the potential loss here of changing this uh, at the 15% is like 250,000. In the off, in the motorbike ATV registrations, uh, currently 2011, there were 134,000 of those sold. But yet, you still can go to uh, uh, if you have an ATV, you can go to the transportation or your motor vehicle and get you a license to operate on the highway. That is separate from your recreation on the trails and on the public lands. Follow up, Mr. Speaker. Would the gentleman from District 8 yield to another question? Gentleman yields. The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good gentleman. So if a person does not register the vehicle well, the vehicle's uh, registration information does not go to ITD. Is that revenue then that would have gone to the state, is that lost? And how much are we estimating would be lost in that process of people who are not, try, not uh, paying the, the, uh, the appropriate fee with ITD on these vehicles? Gentleman from eight. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, good gentleman, I anticipate no loss of revenue. This is not revenue to the state. This is revenue to the recreation programs. This is the user's money, and there's always been the user's money. The only, the only portion that the state retains is for administration, which can be up to 15%. So is that 15% going to be in the Department of Parks and Recreation, or is that 15% going to be utilized over in Idaho Department of Transportation? It doesn't have to be 15%, but that is the maximum allowed. So all the money is returned to the user groups. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, good gentleman. Is there further debate? Gentleman from 32. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, to debate the bill. The gentleman has the floor. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> members of the committee, uh, the body, uh, this is a bad bill, but I don't know how to make it better. We worked on it in committee. Uh, it, it doesn't solve the problem. The problem's not going to go away, and uh, I will be supporting the bill. Uh, it's not often that you get up and say a bill's a bad bill and turn around and vote for it. But uh, I encourage the... We did uh, that for seven hours once. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, I encourage the, uh, the parties uh, involved in this to continue to work on it and see if we can find a better solution. Thank you. Is there further debate? The gentleman from District 15. Mr. Speaker, we request a debate on this bill. Gentleman has the floor. Thank you. I uh, watched this bill very closely in committee. We went through it uh, the whole way. There were a lot of people testified. There was a lot of testimony going on. A couple issues come up. One is it was used to try and capture this away from the groups and everything. It's all these off-road stickers saying that some people just use their registration when they buy a snow machine or a four-wheel or something like that, where they're not running on the road, and they don't pay the sales tax. They just use the registration to get the sticker. Uh, but they couldn't say how many people did it, because it was obviously a small number. 
So in America, we don't punish everyone to get to a very few. That's not what we do in America. That's, that's, that's wrong, and we can't go on that plane. The other thing is, these stickers are available for people that come out of state on the weekends. So a lot of people, by the tens of thousands, come over to Idaho to run their snow machines, to run their off-road vehicles. And the DMV isn't open Friday when they come. So they have to uh, buy it from the hardware store or whoever sells these stickers. A lot of different people are deputized in their businesses to sell these stickers. That's a huge amount of revenue that comes in. So we don't throw this thing down the toilet because of a few dollars in sales tax for dishonest people because we're going to have tax cheats constantly. But this brings in real money. The other thing is I've ridden on these trails where this money goes from parks and recreation. And it's beautiful. I've mountain biked on many of them. And they do a fantastic job. And we're talking hundreds of miles of trails that are recreational trails and bring a lot of tourism into the state. These people that are issuing these permits have had it for 25, 30 years. And they've been doing a great job with it. And I think they need to continue to be able to do the great job and they want to do it, and they're doing it effectively. And this is good legislation. It gets right to the heart of everything that we represent, a lot of us do. It's a good bill, and I encourage you to vote yes, like I will be. Mr. Speaker, thank you, my colleagues. Is there further debate? The lady from District 5. Thank you. Would the uh, gentleman please District. yield the sponsor? Would the bill sponsor yield yields. to a question? The gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and, and gentlemen. Um, discussion we had in committee from Parks and Recreation was that uh, they had a mandate to share certain information with uh, the Department of Transportation. And um, without the technology to do it, uh, there would be something like a $1 million impact to try to get that in place. and. Could you discuss how much of an issue you think that is? Gentleman from eight. Mr. Speaker, good lady. I don't see that as being an issue because recreation and titling are two different issues. And that's why I bring this bill today, is to clarify that they may share recreational registration with ITD, but they don't have to. ITD is still responsible for titling when a person purchases a, uh, a vehicle. But they're completely separate issues, as I see it, and that's why I bring this legislation. Good lady from five. Is there further debate? Would the gentleman from District 8 care to close the debate? Yes, I would, Mr. Speaker, and thank you. I would like to address the concerns that the good lady from 18 have today, and that is concerning the mandate in Idaho Code that Parks and Rec uh, share their information with ITD. And again, titling, everyone is required to title their ATV. You good gentlemen, when you buy an ATV to use on your ranch, you must title that vehicle at the time you purchase it. However, because you're going to use it on your ranch, you never have to buy a recreational sticker. You never have to visit it, DMV again. You are not required to put a license plate on that ATV unless you make the conscious decision that you want to recreate on the public land, then you must buy a recreation sticker. If you want to operate that on a public transportation highway, a county road, city street, you must go to Idaho Department of Transportation, your local DMV, and purchase a license plate, a special license plate for an ATV to have the right to be on the, on the road. These functions are trying, the lines have been trying to get blurred here. There are separate issues, and it's up to the user to decide where they want to use that and what fee they want to pay. So today, ladies and gentlemen, this is not the end game. I am working very diligently to bring all parties together and move this forward for the betterment of the citizens that utilize our great outdoor space in Idaho 
and I urge your support and your yes vote on this bill. Thank you. The good gentleman was close to the debate, and the question is, shall House Bill 279 pass the House? The clerk will unlock the machine, and the members will cast their votes. Has every member voted? Does any member wish to change his vote? The clerk will lock the machine and record the roll. The roll call shows 56 aye, 9 nay, 5 absent, excused. House Bill 279 has passed the House. Is there a correction to title? Hearing none, House Bill 279 will be transmitted to the Senate. Good Mr. Speaker. District 14. Uncle. I move the remaining bills on the third reading calendar hold their place one legislative day. You've all heard the unanimous consent request. Is there an objection? Hearing none, the remaining bills on the third reading calendar will hold their place for one legislative day. Without objection, the House will now return to the seventh order of business, motions, memorials, and, re and resolutions. The House is at the seventh order. In the House of Representatives, House Resolution Number 3, by Ways and Means Committee, a House resolution stating findings of the House of Representatives and providing for the amendment of Rule 64 of the Rules of the House of Representatives. House Concurrent Resolution Number 32, by Ways and Means Committee, a concurrent resolution stating findings of the legislature and rejecting certain final rules of the State Tax Commission relating to income tax administration rules. House Resolution 3 and, and House Concurrent Resolution 32 will be referred to the Judiciary Rules and Administration Committee for printing. The House will now advance to this eighth order of business. First reading of bills, <clears throat> first reading reference of bills and joint resolutions, the House is at the eighth order. In the House of Representatives, House Bill Number 324 by Ways and Means Committee, an act relating to interstate compact on educational opportunity for military children, repealing Section 33.212 Idaho Code relating to educational opportunity for military sh children and amending Title 33 by the addition of a new Chapter 57, Title 33, to establish the Interstate Compact on Educational Opportunity for Military Children to provide a purpose, to provide definitions for applicability, to provide for educational records and enrollment, to provide for placement and attendance, to provide for eligibility, for graduation, for state coordination, for Interstate Commission on Educational Opportunity for Military Children, to provide for powers and duties, for the organization and operation of the Commission, to provide for rulemaking, for oversight, enforcement, and dispute resolution, for financing, to establish provisions relating to member states, effective dates and amendments, to provide for withdrawal and dissolution, to provide for severability and construction, and to provide for binding effect of compact and other laws. House Bill 324 will be referred to the Judiciary Rules and Administration Committee for printing. Without objection, the House will now advance to the 15th order of business announcements. Are there announcements? The lady from District 26. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Sportsman's Caucus will be having uh, a breakfast meeting at 7 a.m. tomorrow, um, or thir yeah, Thursday uh, at 7 a.m. So. Oh, up in the majority caucus room. Are there further announcements? Clerk may read. Following the standing committee meeting announcements again for this afternoon, Agricultural Affairs Committee will not meet, and, on, and upon adjournment, Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee will meet, Local Government Committee will meet, and Transportation and Defense Committee will meet. For tomorrow morning, Education Committee will meet at 8.30 a.m. East Wing, Room 41, DeMordant Chairman. Health and Welfare Committee will not meet tomorrow morning, Wood Chairman. State Affairs Committee will meet tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. East Wing, Room 40, Lurcher Chairman. Revenue and Taxation Committee will meet tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. East Wing, Room 42, Collins Chairman. The House will now advance to the 16th order of business. Adjournment, the House is at the 16th order. Good gentlemen from District 14. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House do now adjourn until the hour of 10.30 a.m. Thursday, March 21st, 2013. Mr. Speaker, I second that motion. You've all heard the motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. As opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. Motion carries. And the House stands adjourned until the hour of 10.30 a.m. Thursday, March 21st, 2013.